Hi everyone, hope you had a good Yom Tov and that you've managed to recover, get your house straight again. This week's parsha is parsha Shemini, um, Shemini meaning eight. So what's the significance of the number eight in this week's parsha? It's the eighth day um, following a seven day period of preparation that the Kohanim had to go through the priests in order to be ready for this day, the eighth day, which was the day of the de dedication of the Mishkan. So for six months had all been building, the whole nation had been focused on this one task to build the Mishkan, the temple for God's presence, his home on earth. And it was really the culmination of everything they'd been through. They'd been out of Mitzrayim and they had received the Torah. And finally, this was almost the end point, something that they'd all been working towards. Um, gathering all the materials and making all the vessels that they needed for this Mishkan. So you can imagine it was a very exciting day for all of them. It was, you know, the end of a project, a massive sense of completion, and it was like a massive cause for celebration. It was like a big yomta for them. And Seda Olam Rabbah, it tells this story from the point of view of one person, of Elisheva. Now, Elisheva was the wife of Aaron HaKohen, and she was also the sister of Nachshon ben Aminadav, who we mentioned a couple of weeks ago. He was the first man to walk into the sea, which caused it to split. So she was from quite an important family, and she married into an important family. And so, as a consequence, she was also the sister-in-law of Moshe. And on this day, four amazing things happened for her. So Seda Olam Rabba, it puts it like this. It says she had Arba Smachot, four celebrations, the Evel Echad, and one mourning. It's a bit like an old fashioned version of four weddings and a funeral, but without Hugh Grant and featuring Elisheva instead. And so it tells the story from her point of view. So you can imagine it was a massive celebration for all of the Jewish people, but for her in particular, it was even more compounded because she was so closely bound up in all the key players on that day. So on that day, Moshe, her brother-in-law, it was the culmination of everything he'd been working towards. It was literally the highlight of his life as a leader. It was the completion of this Mishkan that he spearheaded this project. And finally, it was being put into operation, they were going to actually offer the first Korbanos in the Mishkan on the Mizbeach. So it's it's described as him being king on that day. So that was her brother-in-law. Then her husband, Aaron, was anointed as the Kohen Godol on this day, which was obviously like a very important kosher of position. Like out of all of the tribe of Levi, he was the Kohen Godol. He was the one person who was the main player in the Mishkan. Her brother, Nachshon, was anointed as a as a Nossi of his tribe on that day. So he became a prince. So you can imagine, she's like really quelling, you know, all of her close male relatives are all elevated to these high up positions all on the same day. And finally, the cherry on the cake, as a Jewish mother, her four sons were appointed as the um, the mini Kohanim, the little priests, not the Kohen God or not the high priest, but they all had uh, big jobs to play in the Mishkan and they also got appointed on this day. So you can imagine it was a massive day of joy for her. She probably wore her nicest outfit, she probably got her shaitel done. It was like all very exciting for her. And suddenly it takes a tragic turn because what happened was Aaron offered a carbon on the Mizbeach and this fire came down from heaven and consumed it and you can imagine like everyone's gathered around for this first korban and they see this heavenly fire come down it was all very dramatic and everyone's like oh wow amazing and then his two sons see it Nadav and Avihu his two older sons and they say okay we're also very excited about all this we also want a part to play we know we're also going to be offering korbanas and they just get a bit carried away and they decide they also want to bring a korban and what happens is they bring a korban without being asked to and there's very strict rules about all the korbanas exactly who can bring them and when they can bring them and where they can bring them and what they can bring and they just went ahead and did their own thing and nobody had told them to do it they just went ahead and automatically this heavenly fire came down again but rather than consuming the korban the sacrifice it consumed them and killed them and you can imagine the you know the gasp that went around the crowd it suddenly turned from like the most joyous occasion that everyone had been celebrating together as a nation and suddenly it turned into this massively public tragic event where the whole nation plummeted into mourning 
And you can imagine for Elisheva, she must have been completely devastated, you know, going from one moment to her greatest joy to her like biggest nightmare. And at that moment, Moshe turns around to Aaron and his two remaining sons, Eliza and his summer, and he says to them, you have to carry on with your job. You're not allowed to stop. You're in a really high position of leadership. And as a Kohen Godol, you never get a chance to have a private life. You don't get to mourn. Even if your nearest and dearest die, you're not allowed to put yourself into a state of tumor, um, of impurity. And normally, under normal circumstances, the rest of the Kohanim would have been allowed to. But on this particular day, because it was such an important occasion, it was the day that they'd just been appointed, they, those two sons were also not allowed to mourn. And they had to carry on with the service of the day. So Moshe says to Aaron, you're not allowed out of here. You're not allowed to go and mourn with the rest of the Jewish people. They'll take care of the Kavara. They'll take care of the burial. They'll do the Levaya and will treat them with the utmost respect. But you have to carry on with your job because you're in the middle of doing this massive avoda, this um, high service, which was on behalf of the whole of the Jewish people um, as atonement and to set us on the right track after our mistake with the Egel and this day of dedication is something that we've all been working towards and you have to carry on in your job and if you leave here now you will die so can you imagine he's just lost his two sons his remaining two sons have just lost their brothers and they're told they have to just carry on you know go about work as normal and get on with their day <coughs> Now, you can imagine that's incredibly painful. How can you carry on with your day when your two sons are being buried? But um, we're told that our own didn't respond. We're told our own remained silent. He didn't say anything. <coughs> he didn't do anything. He did just carry on with his job. And Rashi comments <coughs> that as a result of this, he was um, rewarded by having a Navua directly to him, not shared with Moshe, just Hashem is speaking alone to our own. So what does it mean he got rewarded? How can you get rewards for something that you haven't even chosen to do? So I think sometimes we understand a reward as you do a good thing and as a result <coughs> Hashem pays us back with some kind of present. But actually sometimes a reward is just a direct consequence of something that you've done. The fact that you've done it means you're in a different position. The fact that our own remained in his high up elevated state i'm sure he was mourning internally but externally all he was doing was mitzvahs on that day and bringing himself to a higher and higher level as a result of that he obviously was on a high enough level to receive a direct nevuah from hashem so i guess a lot of people over the last year it's been a really painful year and a lot of people have been in this exact situation where Normally, we have an exact protocol for mourning. We have a uh, Levaya, we have a Kavara, we have a Shiva, and some people have den been denied all of those things that are such a comfort to us normally. And instead, what have they done? They've had to get on with it. Of course, we've been mourning, but not in the public way that we're used to mourning. And instead, people have elevated themselves in the situation that, of course, none of us would ever have chosen. But we've made, um, we've made good things come of it because often the things that we do for mourning, they're also for the sake of the neshama of the deceased. So all of the mitzvahs associated with it, saying Kaddish for the deceased, um, people often make dedications, they give sadaka, or they set up a charity or they set up a chesed organization. All of those things are doing good deeds in the merit of the deceased, and that elevates the neshama, the soul of the deceased, to an even higher level. So it happened to our own first in this week's Edra, and maybe until now it was really difficult to understand how he could just carry on. But we've seen now that people do <coughs> somehow <coughs> just carry on against all odds and manage to make such a positive Kiddush Hashem out of the most painful of circumstances. So please God, there will be no more tragedies this year, COVID related or otherwise, but please God, we will continue all the good works we've started this year as a result and continue to um, keep raising all of these neshamas that we've lost over the year to a very high level with all the good deeds and all the mitzvahs we're doing.
Have a very good Shabbos.